Uh, when he was just six years old, Alex Malarkey was in a car crash that left him in a coma. When he emerged from his coma two months later, Alex said that he had died and visited heaven. A few years later, when he was around 12 years old, Alex co-authored a book with his dad about his experience. The book was called uh, The Boy Who Came Back From Heaven, and it sold more than a million copies. I, I wondered if anybody had read that book. Any of you guys read that book? Um, there might have been a show or a movie even, yeah. Well, within a, about a year of the book being published, Alex started making comments online seeming to contradict his, his book, stating that it was all a lie. And then after a few years after that, when he was 17 years old, he made it absolutely clear that it was all entirely fabricated as an intention-getting ploy. Here's what he wrote. I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. Ironically, even though Alex now says that it was not true that he died and went to heaven, he also says that that should not at all decrease our confidence about heaven. Our confidence about heaven doesn't come from his story or any other near-death experience story. Our confidence about heaven comes from the Bible itself because the Bible itself is enough. Many believers, whether they're new believers, or even sometimes have been believers for a long time, often wonder how they can be sure they will go to heaven after this life is over. It's one thing to have the hope of heaven and eternal life through faith in Jesus. It's another thing to know it for sure, to have absolute confidence of heaven. Well, part of the good news of the gospel is that we don't have to guess about where we'll go after we die. Because we have our sins forgiven through faith in Jesus. We can know with certainty that we're going to have eternal life and we're going to be with Jesus forever in the life to come. So even while we look forward to that future, we're blessed today with the sure promise of the inheritance that we have in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 Verses 13 and 14 says this, In him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we often have had so many wonders and doubts in our lives. We wonder about what's going to happen in the course of our lives. We wonder about the afterlife. But help us never to doubt your promises or gifts. Help us to trust you on your word, that we will inherit what you promised by grace, which we receive through our Savior, Jesus Christ, through faith. So thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A museum in Toronto, Canada, tells us the story of a man who lived in the 19th century named Isipo Mutsika, who was more commonly known as Crowfoot. He was the chief of the Siksika Indian tribe, and he was known for his uh, peaceful relations with Canada during a time of great violence. When the Canadian Pacific Railroad was being built and they needed to build part of it on his land, uh, the Canadian government approached Crowfoot with an, with an offer. They said, if you'll give us the land we need for the railroad, you can ride the train whenever you want and wherever you want for the rest of your life. He thought it was a pretty good deal. He said, That's, that sounds like a good deal. So they made a deal. They finished the Canadian Pacific Railroad, and Crowfoot received a lifetime pass, which at the time, that, that was a really amazing thing. Like, there was a brand new technology. Uh, Crowfoot put the pass on a chain, uh, and, and is said to have worn it around, the, around his neck for the rest of his life. He was really proud of this thing. It entitled him to go wherever he wanted, where the railroad could take him. 
But the surprising thing is that Crowfoot never actually stepped foot on the train. He had the right to travel anywhere that he wanted. But he never actually availed himself of that right. Maybe when it came down to it, he was afraid of trains. <laughs> uh, maybe he was just used to horses. That's all he ever knew. Maybe, maybe he just never saw the need of traveling that far. Either way, though, even though he still carried around the guarantee of his deal with the railroad, he never actually used it. There are a lot of Christians like, like Crowfoot. They possess God's promises. They quote them. They frame them. They hang them on their walls. They even post about them on social media. But they never actually make use of them. Charles Spurgeon once said, God never gives us a promise he does not intend for us to use. So when we read the Bible and all the promises and blessings that God gives us in the Bible, don't just read them and get to know them and memorize them, but also see how they apply to your current condition in life and then live according to those promises and blessings that you can have in Jesus. As we've been studying Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, we've been talking about how incredibly blessed we are in Jesus. In him, we've seen that we're holy and blameless, we're adopted as God's children, we're redeemed, we're united, we're given an uh, inheritance. And this week, we're going to see how we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit so that we not only know that we have these blessings from God, but how this causes us to begin to live in the reality of God's blessings even today. The beginning of verse 13 says, In him you were sealed. The Greek word, uh, like I said, I, I read them, but I can't say them. Sfagitzo <laughs> means to set a seal upon, to set a seal upon. It's what a king did with his signet, I wasn't trying to give you a fist. It's what a king did with his signet ring as he stamped a letter to show that the letter that he just wrote was authentic, to set a seal upon. So when God set his seal upon us, he was not only assuring us of the blessings that we have in Christ, but he was swearing by his own name that is true. In other words, because God is true and God doesn't lie, we can be confident that we are truly blessed in Christ because he set his seal upon us, which cannot be revoked. To be sealed means that God not, not only gives us these blessings, but he makes it so that we cannot lose them. We cannot lose them. It's a done deal. And Paul wrote that the way that God sealed us was with the promised Holy Spirit. During Jesus' ministry on the earth, he taught his disciples about the, the, the Holy Spirit who would come and be with us forever. So John uh, records this in, in John 14, 16. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. That's the Holy Spirit. But the promise of the Holy Spirit actually came long before that as well. Proverbs 1, says, if you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you and teach you my words. Isaiah 44, 3 says, I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And then also in Joel 2.28, God says, After this I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. And there's many other times in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, we see that God actually promised many times that his spirit would dwell on us, even dwell in us, not just occasionally, as we sometimes see in the Old Testament, but all the time, enabling us to obey God as we ought and causing old men to dream dreams and young men to see visions. I don't know which one I am, somewhere in between there. Probably old, according to some, young, according to others. Uh, and, and we also see that the, the Holy Spirit would come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean the young people were, well, th that means I was calling th these people young over here then. The young people, uh, 
Appreciate it. Um, but, but then the, the great and terrible day of the Lord would come. That's what we read later in Joel 2, 31. It says, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And when we read those promises, the, these prophecies, we often think that they're talking about the end times, like someday in the future. The moon to darkness, the, the moon to blood, the, the, the sun to darkness. We, we think about the end times when Jesus comes again. But when you read Acts chapter 2, Paul was, or Peter was clearly clear that the Old Testament prophecies about Joel here we're talking about when the Holy Spirit first came. In other words, we don't have to wait for God to fulfill all of his promises to us in the future someday. Someday in the future. We have them now. And the proof is that we have the Holy Spirit. As it says in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of of the possession. Let that really sink in. Because I think if we if we really grasp what that's saying, it's going to make a huge difference in the hope and joy that we experience in this life. We can we can sometimes erroneously think that the the Christian life and all of its blessings depend on us. Like if I want to be blessed by God, then I have to do certain things. I have to, I have to go to church. I have to be faithful to God's word. And, and certainly God wants us to be faithful. But that's not ultimately why God blesses us. God blesses us because God just loves to show his grace. God blesses us because God is love. And before we could do anything to earn anything from God, God blesses us first with Jesus and his spirit. And then, all of, the, all of the other riches that we have in Christ, all of our inheritance, all of the stuff to come, heaven, eternal life, becoming like Jesus, we can be sure of it because we have the Holy Spirit as the down payment. Think of it this way. God himself, comes to dwell in us to assure us that he will never leave or forsake us. It's a very sad thing that many children have been abandoned by their parents, isn't it? But God, but God will never abandon you. It doesn't seem like it should be possible that an adopted child could be abandoned by their adopted parents. It happens far too often in our broken world, but, but God will never leave us. Whom he, he not only adopted us into his family, but also came to live inside of us so that we are not only his sons and daughters, but his home. We're his home. See, thousands of years ago, when the Jews thought about God's home, they would have thought about the tabernacle or, or later the temple, and they would have felt extremely blessed to know that God made his home among them, where they could, they could go to a place and go to worship him and go to sacrifice to him at the tabernacle or, or the temple. But now that Jesus has died for our sins as our sacrifice once for all time, and we're completely forgiven by him and by grace, through faith, God makes his home no longer in a building like, like a church building, but inside of us. See, people oftentimes talk about going to church as if let's go to the house of God. That, that's, that's wrong if they're talking about the building. We are the temple of God. We as the church with a capital C. We, we, the, we the church, the, the people, are the temple of God. First Corinthians says it like this. Don't you know that your temple or your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is inside of you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. 
So while we absolutely should come together to worship God as a church, just as Jesus gave us that example and Hebrews tells us not to forsake gathering, being the church means having the Holy Spirit with us wherever we go, right? And beginning to live in a way that shows the world how good and glorious God is. Just like last week, we saw that this is to be to the praise of God's glory. It glorifies him to give himself to us. Uh, God the Father gave his son to us. Well, first he gave his heart to us in giving us his son. And then God the Son, uh, Jesus, gave us himself when he died on the cross for our sins. And now we see that God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gave us himself when he came to dwell in us, to be with us, to seal us for eternal life. And all of this not only benefit, benefits us immensely, but also glorifies God because it magnifies his goodness toward us. But this isn't automatic. We're, we're not born with the Holy Spirit in us. Paul tells us exactly when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. Uh, look at verse 13 again. It says, In him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, and when you believe. You see, we receive the Holy Spirit and therefore the assurance of all of God's blessings toward us when we hear the truth, which is the gospel, and believe the truth. And the gospel in four words is simply this. We sinned, Jesus saves. We sinned, Jesus saves. To become a Christian, receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving God's salvation from sin and hell, and receiving all the promises and blessings of God, you simply believe the gospel that all, although you sin, Jesus saves. Paul describes this here as the word of truth. There are a ton of false things that we could believe that are just so incredibly prevalent in our world today, right? We could believe that we need to make something of ourselves. We could believe that we have to measure up by doing good things, that, that we have to get everything just right in order to please God and earn our way. But the gospel is called the word of truth because there is only one truth. And all of these other things are lies that will only lead to disappointment. Jesus said it like this, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. There is no other. Jesus is the way. There is no other. So when we think we can make our lives have meaning apart from primarily resting in Jesus, we've believed a lie. But when we find our lives in Jesus, because Jesus is the life, we've begun to live according to the truth. And by living according to the truth, we begin to see just how blessed we are in Christ. As we started studying Ephesians, I mentioned that verses 3 through 14 in the original language appear to be one long sentence about how incredibly blessed we are in Jesus. And I think Paul wrote it that way because the blessings that we have in Christ are not just blessings that we have in Christ, but they are who we are in Christ. So you're not just blessed with holiness and, and blamelessness. You are holy and blameless. That's who you are in Christ. You're not just blessed to have been adopted by God. You are his child. And we can keep on going, talking about all the blessings we have in God. You are redeemed. You are united in Christ with all other believers, both today and throughout history. You are absolutely and unconditionally loved and forgiven. And you are all of these things because God is love and God loves you. Our identity as Christians is rooted in Jesus. We might, find, we might be tempted to find our identity in so many other things, identifying with a political party or in our gender or sexuality or in our occupation, 
But when we receive Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit who seals us as his own. We're God's, which means that our identity is found in him. I read a cool illustration of what this means. If you were to buy a bottle of water at a grocery store, it might cost you somewhere between, I don't know, 50 cents and a dollar, right? Something like that. Uh, if you were to buy a bottle of water at a restaurant, it might cost you between $2 and $4. If you were to buy that same bottle of water at a baseball game or an airport, it might cost you $6 or more, right? For each of these prices, the water is roughly the same. The only difference is where you purchased it. Have you ever felt your value fluctuate depending on where you were in life? Maybe at times in your life you felt like you had a lot of worth because you had accomplished a lot. But at other times you felt close to worthless because things weren't going so well for you. But in the Bible, we find that we are infinitely valuable to God. Because our value isn't found in our circumstances or our feelings or how much we think that we've accomplished with our lives, but in the fact that we are made in the image of God. And in the fact that even though we've all sinned against God, God still loved us. And Jesus died for us, forgiving us of all of our sin so that we can find our worth and identity once again where it should have been found all along in God our Savior. And this is one big package deal. We don't get to choose the parts of Christianity that we like and discard or reinterpret the parts of the Bible that we don't like. That's typically what we want to do. We like forgiveness. We like joy. We like hope. So we receive Jesus as our Savior thinking that we can just have those things. But, but God wants us to be totally transformed. He gives us his Spirit to live in us to transform us, to empower us, not just to squeeze Jesus into our already busy lives, but to truly see Jesus as our life. Because he is the way and the truth and the life. And if you've tasted and seen just how good God is, then surely you desire to have Jesus not just as your Savior, but as your Lord. In contrast to all the other things in our lives that promise joy and don't fulfill, Jesus gives us real hope and joy as we rest and rejoice in him.